There's nothing worse than this same bland food day after day. Even if we have a wonderful steak, but it's, it's plain, it's without spice or without sauce, we'll get bored of it very, very rapidly. We want flavor. The same thing is true for the 18th century. People in the 18th century, they craved wonderful flavors and diversity in flavors. Spices are incredibly common in the 18th century. Whole industries were driven by spices. The king of spice, nutmeg, brought from halfway across the world to feed England, to feed America. People are just so desirous of these flavors. Nutmeg is so common, mace is common, we have cinnamon, we have lots of pepper, all these expensive spices. And truly, these spices are spices for the rich. Yes, everyone desired them, but not everyone could afford them. The fact that the spices were so expensive drives desire for them. Nutmeg coming from the South Pacific, we've got all kinds of spices coming out of Asia, we have different spices even coming out of the West Indies, things like allspice. One of the most common ones that's kind of looked down upon is ginger, because it was less expensive in the time period, but still used a lot, giving you a nice hot spicy food. Now, poor people in the 18th century are just as desirous of these wonderful and expensive flavors. They aren't just sitting there eating the same plain food and not wanting something different. They want wonderful flavors, but they can't afford them. Our cookbooks, yeah, they're filled with spices because they're cookbooks for rich people. There aren't cookbooks for poor people in the 18th century. Nobody's bothering to write for these people. They can't afford a cookbook, much less the spices. This makes researching poor people food in our time period kind of difficult, but we do have some wonderful clues to that. And it turns out that there are ways to get wonderful spicy flavors without expensive spices, spices that you have to import from halfway across the world. What if you can get those wonderful spicy flavors out of your kitchen garden right outside your door so that they really don't cost you really anything? And that's exactly what they're doing. Kitchen gardens are very popular in our time period. Every poor person usually has enough room that they can have a little tiny garden for growing these spicy flavors. While their kitchen garden couldn't supply them with nutmeg, cinnamon, allspice, it could give them some other wonderful spicy flavors. Things like onions, garlic, leeks, different sorts of herbs, all sorts of things can come out of a simple kitchen garden. Now using things from your kitchen garden like that to spice your food, something like onions or garlic, that's looked down upon. Rich people would call these folks garlic eaters. This is from Nicholas Cresswell's journal in 1776. He's in New Jersey or New York. When one Collins, an Irish merchant of myself, rambled about town till three in the afternoon before we could get anything for breakfast. At length, we found a little Dutch tippling house and persuaded the old woman to get us something to eat. It was a stew of pork bones and cabbage, so full of garlic, nothing but necessity would have compelled me to eat it, and my companion would not taste another mouthful. The enslaved population in North America played a vital role in developing just these sorts of flavors. They're in their kitchen garden growing those special flavors in things like tomatoes and chili peppers. When researching cooking for the poor, a book I've found that's been very, very helpful is this New Art of Cookery by Juan Altamiras, and it's sort of translated for us and annotated by Vicki Hayward. And this book really is outstanding for the time period. It's full of Spanish cookery, so that's a little different than what we're used to, and it, it does have a lot of different ingredients than you would normally find in English cookery. But Juan here is a friar, and he is specifically creating a cookbook that has dishes that aren't the super high expensive dishes. Dishes that can be done by poor people or even in poor settings, like a poor monastery, which is what he was working within. There were people within this setting that were not happy that he did a cookbook like this. And the cookbook is written in a very, very personal manner. And he has a lot of sort of internal anecdotes inside of the recipes so that we get a real glimpse into what he was thinking about when he used particular kinds of ingredients. 
And a lot of the spicing, a lot of the flavors here come not from those expensive spices. I don't think you'll find nutmeg anywhere in this cookbook, certainly not used extensively. No, you will find things like garlic, tomato, and other simple herbs to give you those intense flavors that you would normally get with expensive spices. Spain in the 18th century was very different than it had been 100 and 200 years previously. It had been a superpower, if not the world superpower. And by the time we get to 1745, when this was printed, they're on the way down. And they were having a lot of internal problems as well as crop failures. Unlike in America, Spain in this time period had a very large population of peasants, of poor people, compared to a very small population of rich people. So therefore, they had a large tradition of using non-expensive spices to get you those wonderful flavors. A really good recipe from this cookbook that demonstrates what we've been talking about is this lamb and pepper stew. And let me give you a quick read of it. The translation goes like this. For pebre, prepare your meat servings. Brown them in your stew pot. Take note of their weight so your other ingredients are in proportion. Pound garlic, salt, and peppercorns together in your metal mortar. Wash them into the olla with water. Throw in bay leaves and for every 30 servings, a pound of olive oil and a cured ham bone. Even a bone with very little meat on it gives a lot of flavor to a stew. Now put it to cook over a gentle fire. And when it is done, dress it with a handful of parsley, pounded hard boiled eggs, thinned with the stew's juice, some sharp citrus juice, or even better, tomatoes. Let all this simmer together for a little while. It is very good, a tasty dish to serve every so often. But take note, the flavors are more intense than in other stews. I love this recipe because of the ingredients it uses. Many things that we don't normally use on the channel, especially for 18th century English cookery. So we don't use, at least us particularly, use a lot of lamb or mutton. So we've got some lamb here. It uses a lot of garlic and tomatoes. Again, super rare. You just do not see that much in English cookery. And this idea that it's this very intensely flavored stew. And so many times we think about English cookery in the time period being bland, right? But this is anything but that. The recipe mentions an olla, and that's a ceramic cooking vessel, something like this, usually a little bit more rounded, especially at the bottom. And we see that a lot in Spanish cookery. You also see cooking in ceramic pots like this, uh, many times in Dutch cookery and probably even English cookery too. And that's for cooking very low and slow. It's uh, basically a ceramic casserole dish. You have a nice, fairly tight fitting <coughs> lid on it. They don't take a lot of heat very well. So you have to be very careful when you're cooking with these and they tend to be sort of semi disposable they're not gonna last for more than maybe a, a couple of months but they were fairly inexpensive cooking vessels at the time period and so you'll see them a lot especially probably in poor people cooking today we'll be using a black cast iron pot these are nice thick walled pots so they they really work well for a dish that needs to simmer a long time and they're really sturdy to start out this recipe, we're going to brown our lamb. I'm going to cut this up into uh, little bite-sized pieces. For the lamb here, we're using a leg cut, which is typical for these kind of stewed lamb dishes. And then we'll brown it in our cooking vessel with a little bit of olive oil. And then we'll let that stew and simmer a little while to kind of break down. Now we'll mix the salt, pepper, and garlic. Grind that up into a paste that we can wash into the cooking vessel. After our meat has stewed for about an hour and a half, I'm gonna add in some smashed boiled egg, a little bit of parsley, and a tomato or two. There's a lot of fascinating techniques and ingredients used in this cookbook, and it's specifically Spanish. But I was amazed by the connections that I found, specifically with that Cresswell reading. 1776, he's in New York, and he's eating a soup of pork bones that has lots and lots of garlic in it. It's almost exactly like this recipe. Here we go. This smells amazing. And it's got a really, really 
fun and a great look to it. So even though it's kind of a simple dish and I thought it was gonna end up kind of being watery, but it's really got a rich stew kind of consistency to it, which is the way I like it. I like a nice thick stew. So this looks great. I can't wait to try this. And I'm really wondering about those intense flavors he talks about in the recipe itself. Let's find out. Mmm, man. That lamb is so tender and great flavors. You gotta try this one out. So good. Mmm.